When it comes to cars, it seems like, in North America at least, most things are black and white. I was doing a bit of research online, thinking about what kind of marketing research problem I would consider to show you as an example. I did run across a great bit of information that occurred in the Globe and Mail, and th there they reported that the top two selling cars in North America, car colors that is, is black and white. So, given the black and white scenario, I wanted to check to see if the people of Clarenville, Newfoundland, more or less, fit the same mold as the rest of North America. Are black and white cars the most common cars on the road? So what I'm going to do today is a little bit of an observational technique where I'm going to take, we're going to take, all of us are going, we're going to take a little quick view of Clarenville and to see if the hypothesis that, you know, the top two cars are either black or white, the top two colors. So come along, let's see what we can do here. Hey, black, white, I think we're off to a good start. Let's do it. In terms of an observational study, one of the best places to look would be the car lots in town. What are the types of cars that car dealerships are getting come in? So if we took a look, we could count to see how many cars are there, and of that, how many cars are black and white. I'll do that very quickly here now. So let's go. If we take a quick look at this dealership, you can see that black, 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 And here we have another dealership, and you can see white, and black, and blue, and black, and gray, and blue, and red, and black. So now we got a brown, white, brown, white, brown, blue, white, brown, gray, black, purple, red and gray, kind of a green, white, white. So here I am stood up at one of the busiest intersections in Clarenville. At this point in time, what I'm trying to do is to measure the type of traffic that's going through in terms of what color they are. If I stood here for an amount of time, say for example two hours, I would probably count a thousand cars. I could also calculate what color they are. Based on my observational research of watching cars naturally flow through, and I would assume that it would be a representative population of Clarenville. I could determine whether or not the hypothesis that I had stated, that black and white cars are the two most popular colors, I could determine if that was in fact the case. That would in turn give me some ammunition to argue in my conclusions that yes, black and white cars, like the rest of North America, are the two most popular colors in Clarenville. Okay, we're back in the office, so we've gone out, we've collected our observational research. Now we need to think about how are we going to do this, what are we going to do, and what is the overall strategy here. Well, again, I want to remind you of the stages of the marketing research process. We have uh, problem discovery, which is our initial stages, and then the problem discovery. In this particular case, I said, well, one of the things we need to do is determine the top two color cars relative to the North American standard. And in order to be able to make it measurable, we need really to be very specific with regards to our hypothesis. So what I've done is I've created a hypothesis here, and effectively my hypothesis says the color frequency of cars in the town of Clarenville is the same as the color frequency in the rest of North America. More specifically, black and white vehicles make up close to 43%, plus or minus 2%, of the car colors in Clarenville. So again, I have set a standard there that is measurable and it's very important that you do that when you create a hypothesis because what you need to be able to do is do all your research to prove or disprove the hypothesis. So that's our first step. We've set about a hypothesis that effectively says Clarenville is no different than anywhere else in North America. We've gone out and we've done our observational research. Now we could also do a survey research and I'll show you uh, a little brief on this idea of the concept of a survey. So just let me take you there for a second. When we, do, when we do a survey, one of the things that's important is that we get a representative sample of the people in our community. 
our hypothesis stated that we're concerned about the people of Clarenville. That then will be the population. What we need to be able to do is to survey them, take a small sample of them, in order to make a determination that we could apply to the population as a whole. It's a bit of a challenge in order to do a survey because one of the things we need to do is to get that representativeness. One of the things we can do is to uh, put everyone's name in a hat and pull out however many, 100, 200, and go and survey those. That would be very complicated and somewhat cumbersome. So we have to make some sort of a, a compromise. We want to be able to get really good uh, issues with regards to a probability sample, meaning that everyone has an equal chance to be selected. However, we have to recognize that we have time, uh, money, and other constraints that come into play. So what I would suggest we do with this is we create a survey question and we simply send it out over the internet and get people to do it. Now that's what's called a non-probability sample. A non-probability sample means not everyone has an equal opportunity to be selected. When you consider that not everyone in Clarenville is on the internet, not everyone is connected to me sending it out or I don't have everyone's email addresses, that would certainly indicate that no, we're not going to get a good representative sample. Further, people may not send it back. There could be a bunch of issues. However, if we, send, if we are okay with that, if we say, okay, we're looking for to get a gist of the problem or a gist of the situation, then I think that this type of approach would work just fine. So what we're going to do, here's the, here's the plan, is we're going to create a survey, and the survey question would be a single question that we're going to send out, and that single question will be built upon the North American statistics that we got for car colors. Essentially, the question would ask, select the color of the car that you most often drive. We'd send it out to people in Clarenville. The people in Clarenville would select one of those responses, send it back. We then would calculate the results. Now, using a computer program, particularly a software, a piece of software that's designed to do surveying, such as fluidsurveys.com, we could go and do this, and it would actually not only send the survey out, but it would also calculate the results for us. That would be great. And then we can make some conclusions. I'm just going to put that aside, though, and, and carry on with our observational bit of research that we did. You saw that I was out, and we counted the cars. And uh, in the observation, what we're doing is looking at a certain number of cars. In this particular instance, I saw 129 cars today when I went out. Of those 129 cars, I have shown to you, I'll show to you now the statistics on what I got on that. You will notice that based on my observation, 29% of the cars were white, 16% were black, 10% were silver, 10% were gray, and the others were 40% made up of their colors. So again, I'm most concerned about the top two. The basic conclusion that I can draw, just looking at it alone, is that, yeah, white and black are the most popular colors. But keep in mind that I stated a hypothesis, and the hypothesis was very clear. Not, a, not that it had to be the most, it had to be the most by about the same amount as North America. So, uh, I need to check my hypothesis. So. My findings indicated, when I combine the white and black, my findings indicated that black and white vehicles made up 45% of the cars observed in Clarenville today in the time period that I used. My hypothesis stated that black and white vehicles make up close to 43, plus or minus 2% of the car colors in Clarenville. Well, looking at my findings and looking at the hypothesis, I would conclude that I will accept the hypothesis, meaning that Clarenville is on par with North America. Indications are that it is on par with North America. I then would draw my conclusions and put it in a report format, outlining what I did today in order to collect that information, some of the challenges with that information, for example, some of the errors that may have created. You know, I went up at lunchtime, maybe I should have checked it over a longer period of time, these sorts of things. But with those caveats in place, I did conclude, based on the data that I collected, that Clarenville was very much in par or on par with the rest of North America. So, having gone through the whole process now, just to reiterate, if we look at the stages of the marketing process, the six stages, here's what I did today in order to work through those six stages. First, I developed a problem, discovery, and definition. 
I looked at the articles, I thought, is Clarenville on par with the rest of North America with regards to car color choice? I developed a research design. In this case, the observational design was what I used, and it was a matter of going out and simply watching cars go by. I didn't strictly use sampling. I showed you that I had a potential question that I could use to sample, but I did certainly gather data. So step four was the data gathering. I got the data come in from 129. I went then and I processed the data using a spreadsheet. And from that spreadsheet, I calculated that, yes, the top two colors were black and white. And I further calculated that I met my hypothesis by accepting the fact that about the same number of cars in Clarenville were black and white as in North America, if we counted those as the top two. So that was my effective conclusion. So that's essentially how the marketing research process works. This will be something that you'll have to do for your assignment. I hope you got something out of this today. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact me. And all my contact information is in the course. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you.